that's like like that you off limits that you don't talk about or like not for me. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. All right, welcome to 42, Two Souls, One Journey, a raw and unedited look into our lives as humans. Based on the 21 Grams experience, oh my God, the 21 Grams experiment, you think I've said this so many times I wouldn't forget, 21 Grams experiment by Dr. Duncan McDougall, who concluded that the human soul weighs 21 grams. On this podcast, we will explore that no matter what our lives look like on paper, we, our souls journey similarly. Okay, guys, on this episode, we are speaking with the master of all trades. By day, he's a VP of some huge research firm. But by night, he's a Bollywood diva with the contemporary stylings of Deepika, with the grace of Madhuri. Oh, that's a compliment. And he ages like, he's going to age like Rekha. He's brown boy magic with the soul of your 90-year-old Punjabi auntie. Welcome, Vijay Wada Wada. Oh, my God. Yay. Vijay Wada one. <laughs> Hi, I'm so excited. Me too. I feel like we've, so you know, like we've known each other for a while now. Mm -hmm. We've shared an ex-boyfriend. And just that minor detail. Yeah. But it's interesting because I feel like that is, like that strengthens our bond in some really weird oh, way. Oh, 100%. Right? Like 100%. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like oh, I love Vijay because I feel like we can talk about our exes, our ex like habits with yeah. it and like our, in, our ex-in-laws uh, and laugh about it because now it's been years since we've, we've both been with yeah. him and it's fun it's like and it's, it, and it's we're both reality. friends with him still which yeah, is and people always find really weird and awkward but they're like how are you friends with your ex's ex and your ex and i'm like i i love it i've spent i spent five years with him you spent years with him like it was it's important <laughs> and i like i love howie for him as well which is that's the yeah part. absolutely i love where he's going and i remember when him and I broke up and you guys started dating. And I was like, dear God, if I can get Vijay, I should get someone just as exciting or as amazing. Oh, <laughs> thanks. So this is really great. Um, so today's topic is love. And uh, it's the, it starts off February, Valentine's month. Um, and the funniest thing that came into my uh, inbox is from it's called the universe and it said for the record Shafiq here's what matters what here's what really matters every single day that you know how much you are loved and I was like of course the timing is amazing and it's had to show up today I love it yeah <clears throat> um so I went back to the first time I met you and I can't remember specifically because when I think I might have been in drag to I think I just found out you were dating Ahez so those two things. I knew you <laughs> years before that, but <clears throat> at okay. Beisharam, I remember meeting you and you were in drag. Okay. And it was like before I was like, like I was kind of out, but not really. And I was like kind of still just getting used to like the Toronto queer scene. And I discovered this kind of community of brown queers. And I went and I remember seeing you in drag and I was like, oh my God. And I remember my friend being like, oh my God, look at how low her like sorry is tucked. Like, oh my God, it's a man. And I was like, that's a man. And I was like, and it was just like magic when I saw you and I loved watching you perform. And I remember I used to be that like really annoying Twinkie Brown boy was like, why aren't you in drag every time I saw you outside of drag? And so, um, but yeah, we, we, I remember meeting you then, but I don't think we really got to know each other until later on for sure, so. Um, and that was after uh, I was dating our ex. Right. I mean, nah, we'll just call it out. So, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I know for <laughs> no, I talk about him in a different podcast, but I feel like he's such a okay, great. threat in my life. Um, and some really great lessons came out of that relationship. Of course. And him. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about this. So your little twink brown boy who comes to Toronto, where was Vijay from originally? Where are you? So I grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, actually Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, which is across the bridge, um, which is, you know, a kind of very typical East Coast suburban type of community. And I grew up there, which was interesting, I guess. It was a pretty like white conservative place, but it was, you know, quiet, 
community oriented, whatever. Um, and we had a small uh, South Asian community in Halifax. And then when I was going to university, I was in a co-op program. And so I was coming here every four months and kind of made Toronto home. And that's where I came out. And uh, I moved here uh, like officially, like full time in 2010 uh, or 2011, sorry. And, uh, uh, but I, I had been here kind of off and on for three years doing my co-op. So I was, Toronto felt like home more still than Halifax by the time I moved here. That's so funny because I feel like two thousand only ten years ago, but you feel like such a staple within the community um, that it feels like you've been here longer. I I think um, the Toronto queer community, particularly the Toronto South Asian queer community, was like it finally felt like I'd found kind of home, and I felt a lot of love from the community. I was meeting people that were like, like me, and it just felt like a very kind of comfortable experience. And you know, I'm as you know, I'm quite close with my family, but I've been like very lucky in being able to kind of have my own kind of chosen family as well, which has provided me with just as much love and, you know, support and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very grateful for all that. You know, I think like if people see you, so two things about you that are so fascinating for me is that one, you are, even though you grew up in Halifax, you're so close to your, your family. Like, you know, I always uh, equate love to coming from, that's our starting point of love, right? Like we see that in our, yeah. Um, in our parents and our sisters and our in our family members and being yeah. little gay brown boys who live in I mean I live in North York it's not as suburban as uh, Dartmouth but still like you know you don't I don't remember meeting any gay people until I was twenty like mm -hmm. I was nineteen right mm -hmm. but my base of love and what love looked like came from my family uh, and even though I felt like I didn't belong or there's moments where I just no you know I never felt like I didn't belong because I feel like my family was always like um so maybe not all my family member but specifically my sister Salima was always like oh you want to play with Barbie like she never had and she still doesn't her things are my things no matter what gender they belong to and <laughs> including me, like, her wedding langa including her wedding like, like you can still go and get stuff from her closet and she's like yeah sure whatever you need to do um it. like 90% of my drag clothes I think are hers <laughs> I actually she thinks think that, are too gaudy I think that one of our like one of the things that really bonds us is our relationship with our sister. Uh, Cause I, I'm really close with my sister. You're super close with your sisters. And I like, I love seeing your relationship kind of online, but also just like when I see you guys interacting and all that kind of stuff, I can tell that there's like a really pure love between you guys. And I think that for me, that's like a really beautiful connection that we have that like we both share that bond with our sister. That's so funny. One of my questions is, tell me about Jaya. Who is she to you? Like, I'm, I'm oh. just as fascinated about you and Jaya as I am about you. So tell me, yeah. tell us about Jaya. Jaya is, um, she's obviously my sister. She's younger. So she's three and a half years younger than me. And kind of side story. I remember when I was like about three years old being at the mall. And you know, in the malls, they sometimes had like uh, water fountains. Yeah. And you could throw in like, you know, pennies for, for a wish. I remember throwing in a penny and wishing for a baby sister. And it was like when my mom was pregnant and I was like, I want a baby sister. And then I had my baby sister. And then we, we grew up and we were close growing up, but like we did fight a lot. Like we physically fought and like, we also just like fought a lot. But I think after she kind of turned 17 and we also had a bit of separation, we really just appreciated the, the role that each of us played in each other's lives. And she's like a fierce protector of mine. So like, similar to how you talk about like Salima, like coming out, like she was like, she's been like pushing when I was kind of scared to push, she was like, no, you're gonna like do this. And she's something I really like kind of love about my sister is that <clears throat> she doesn't take shit from anyone. And she doesn't really kind of care about like whether or not someone else thinks what, what she's doing is okay. If she's confident in it, then she's gonna do it. And that's not something that I have, but that's something that she's taught me a lot of. So she's like, she's a teacher to me. She's like one of my best friends. We talk kind of every day. Um, but yeah, like, I think that your relationship with your family and my relationship with my family, I think there's a lot of kind of similarities and parallels that we can kind of draw, so. 100%, uh, and I love to hear this about Jay, because I feel like I 
know her through this virtual representation of who she is with you. I've met her once or twice, but every time I meet her, I'm like, she's got my, she's got Salima vibes. So okay. I have two sisters, one Salima and Farah. Farah people have met on the podcast, but Salima is like, has a wall. You takes you a moment to break it. And when you break it, it's like much. And right. Jess comes in and do this beautiful force that it just stands there. It's like, hi, I'm Jay, what's up? Yes. And you're like, okay. okay. That, like, I, like, I haven't broken through the wall yet. But I feel like the moment, I, well, I feel like at, when I do and if I do, there's this <clears> sense <throat> of love that's going to come out from her. That's very Vijay. That right. I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to do with it, but she's got that where she's like, you're going to earn this. And yeah. I'm not good at it. I'm like, here, you want my love? Take it. <laughs> yes. I, and I can be a bit guilty of that too, in terms of like, you know, <clears throat> trying to love people who also like aren't ready for that intense type of like, okay, wow, like we're doing this type of, okay. So I, I can totally understand that. You're in it to win it. No matter what you do, you're in it to win it. Like think from the moment I met you, you're like, like when you're like, this is what I want to do, you just jump in and you're done. So I think the moment you commit to something, it's in a million percent. And people just have like, get used to it, just get over it. You do. Yeah, that's who you are. Yeah. Like I, I think, I feel like I've, like I've seen you dance passionately. I've seen you fight passionately. I've seen you love passionately. Like. Like you're 100% in or nothing. I can be a very extreme person, which, you know, is plays to a lot of strengths, but also can play to my weaknesses, but it's about balance, so. Yeah. So that makes you human, I think, like, you know, like, because I think I've seen, I've also seen you on low days, right? Like, right. I, I've seen you being compassionate and have those moments where, like, the the Beishram Vijay doesn't show up, but, like, here right. the human Vijay shows up, and you're like, great. Like, the auntie Vijay shows up, where he's like, hey, can I come and make your body? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's go back to earlier where you were talking about like you came to Toronto and you the, the, the gate scene welcomed you like but from what I know of you is you have an insane network of gay brown men boys people in your life and you consistently build it and grow it yeah where did that where did that come from for you like and was it a choice you made it was definitely a choice um I think it came from just the feeling of like finally being able to connect with people who had like experiences that I could relate to and shared kind of a similar cultural and family background to me. And I also grew up in a house where like my parents were, they liked socializing with friends and they enjoyed, you know, getting together and building their own kind of network. And if you know my dad, like my dad is like, he knows someone in like places all over the place. He, you know, will find a connection somehow. And so I've kind of taken that over, but I used to travel to the US a lot as well. And anytime I went to the US, I used to post like, oh, I'm going to this city or whatever. And then someone in the US would be like, oh, meet up with this person or, or I know this friend. And then, so I would kind of continue to build my, my network, but you know, and then obviously South Asian filter on grinder was helpful as well. And I want to be my friend. Oh, I love that. The South Asian filter on grinder. I have never tried that before actually no i've never tried that before maybe i'm going to like i feel like that's a great uh yeah, a great way of connecting with like new brown boys yeah. and i feel like in the gay culture like our first like at least in my experience the first success is always sex or like a sexual connection right. and then you become friends with these people unless they're dating your ex or friends with other friends unless you meet through other friends um but like it like i feel like back in the day i was so ashamed of that i was like oh my god we can't do it we can't but now i'm like whatever that's how we're gonna be friends yeah. And yeah. like, yeah, you can, I, I think that we connect with people in so many different ways that like we can't put a lot of judgment on like how we're connecting or whether we're doing it in the right way or anything like that. I feel like there's just like something I've learned, I think, <clears throat> as I think 2020 taught this to a lot of us too, but like we just kind of have to go with the way things kind of naturally fall out and pushing against that or trying to make it fit into some sort of box is like, not worth the heartache sometimes or most of the time I should say so oh I love you use the word heartache because it really does feel like a because you're in 100 percent. I feel like the heart it feels like a heartache mm -hmm. you're not yeah. investing like you know exactly. um but one thing I love about you is like because I feel like we've known each other for over 10 years like in our lives yeah. for over 10 years and like you started off as a little gay twink right yes that really wasn't <laughs> and now you've grown and evolved into this like into an uncle with a belly I mean, you're still an auntie. <laughs> I think if people knew you, you were always that auntie in between. 
just visually and visually our bodies change anyways right and if, yeah and i feel like you're you're laughing about your stuff but you're so kind about other people like you're so body positive with everybody else <laughs> except when it comes to yourself uh, it is my, my just like a you know self-deprecating humor that i have of myself so yeah, yeah. It's, it's our moms enough i think like <laughs> those poor ladies have to go through it and we exactly do the same <laughs> Um, so you grow involved all the time. Like you consistently, I've consistently seen you work on yourself and ask those really smart questions. You know, and, and for me, I think I started in my late thirties to do, I started in my thirties to do that. You started a lot earlier. How did that, like what happened in your life that's, that you said, no more, I'm gonna, or were you always like this? Sorry, no more, I'm gonna consciously build myself to be this kind of human? I think that, um, I've always been someone who's been like really curious about people like in general, like that kind of drives a lot of my, the way that I operate. And so I ask a lot of questions and I listen to a lot of people and what they're saying. And so I, and I always had kind of an affinity to listening or like hearing about people's like life journeys and what lessons they've learned and stuff like that. And so I've always um, been able to kind of connect with a bunch of different types of people, which has allowed me to kind of have more of like more different perspectives in my life. So like one of the things that I love most about my life is that I have so many different types of friends. And like, if you looked at like the people that I, you know, maintain relationships with or friendships with people would be like, Oh, they're all like Brown queer men, but like, yeah, a lot of them are, but there's a lot of people outside of that as well. And they kind of range in ages and professions and, you know, upbringings and class and all this kind of stuff. So I feel like my understanding of people uh, and my curiosity around people has kind of driven that need to like self-improve because I feel like, I think I always knew that I lived a pretty sheltered life growing up in Halifax where like, I didn't have a lot of diversity. I like, my parents were pretty traditional in terms of like my upbringing and that kind of thing. And I, I think I always knew that there's more to things outside of what I've been taught. And so I was like, I've been eager to kind of like just get out there. Cause I think that, that kind of shyer part of me is a bit, is kind of how I've been taught to, to act versus what I actually am inside. So. I mean, I think that's one of your superpowers is that you know how to connect with people. And like, you also make an extra effort to go out of your way to be like, like, okay, great. What do we have in common? How do we blend? Like, it's mm. such a, it's amazing to see in person, but it's also amazing to hear you recognize that. Um, speaking of diverse, so speaking of diverse people, you know, and parents, you yes. are amazing at, and, and really I think it's guided through love is how you introduce your parents to all your friends, no matter who they are, what they look like, what spectrum they sit on. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of, as a non matter of fact, you're like, great, dad, here's my friend so and so, just so they are into, not, actually, not just your parents, your parents and your nieces and nephews who are kids. And to just be like, this is what the world of platter looks like. Welcome to my epic birthday party. Yeah, and yeah. here are these beautiful weirdos that I know. Yeah. And I love them all. Um, um, what was the yeah that was a really interesting experience so that was actually the first time that i've like introduced my family to like a broad number of my friends that were so diverse and that was very intentional so i'm not someone who celebrates like my birthday on an, on an annual basis it's not something that i'm like big on but because it was my 30th i was like you know what i'm gonna just do like a big party and part of this was along my parents journey of like accepting me and so I was like, they need to kind of see that not only do I have like friends, but like that these people really love me and like care about me and, you know, they're coming out to celebrate me. And like, cause I think a lot of my parents' fears is that like, I'm alone. I don't have anyone. Like, you know, it's like when you're getting married that kind of like traditional type of thinking. And so for me, when I was organizing my birthday party I said, okay, I'm gonna have like a smaller intimate group at the beginning where I'm going to do like a dinner and my parents will actually just like kind of like dip their toe into like the gay water and like there's and, no dipping just FYI you submerged them oh, and you waterboard like, them like within like two seconds we went from like the shallow end all the way into the deep end um but it was like it was a kind of this progression and you know I remember my mom saying like wow like all your friends are so nice and I was like 
of course, like, I'm not going to be friends with mean people, right? Like, and they're like, and she was just, I think it finally allowed her to kind of see people as like just people versus like the, the label of like, whether they're gay or they're queer or whatever. And like, seeing how comfortable my niece and nephews were around everyone and how they were dancing with my friends and like having a good time. I think it was like one of those moments of realization for my mom where like, okay, things are going to be okay. Like I don't have to worry as much because I think that a lot of parents concerns when it comes to like, especially South Asian kids like coming out is that yeah, my, my kid life is going to be so different and I'm, you know, and I don't have control over that. And I do think that it comes from a place of love most often and we just have to kind of recognize that sometimes they need just like those like pushes because I never did that before like I was out for like six years before that and I never pushed my parents and then I was like no this is like that that's when I was like no that's enough like I need to kind of prioritize myself and make sure that you know my parents see that my life is is great like what happened though I feel like I'm gonna make an assumption is that like in your 30s, the breakup with Nahid happened. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even for me, Nahid was this staple. Like, uh, first time in my life, when I came out, I was like, great dad, I've came out, but here I am with an smiley guy who's a doctor. Like, who checks off all the boxes that you'd want your daughter to marry? Mm -hmm. And, and like, perfect. Like, here you go, I'm okay. And we didn't have to, and there was no questions the seven years we were together. The moment we broke up, my parents were like, okay, now, like, now their yeah. sense of security got shook. Their senses, not yeah. my sense. Well, also my sense of security. But then they were like, "Okay, now he is not fitting a mold that we know. Right? What do we do?" And I think my mom had the same question. She's like, "Are you gonna be okay? Like, do you feel like that? That that feels like yeah, it was our timing is very like, similar. It it it's like that. I I think it's just that um that fear or worry that like things aren't gonna be okay for and like." how are you, like, my mom's like, how are you going to survive? I'm like, mom, like, like, I, I'm fine. Like, I, I, I work, I, like, pay my own bills. Like, this is not going to be that much different, except for the fact that I'm not in a relationship. And so I think that, like, yeah, I, I, I think in many ways I did try to fit the mold, but I think that Nahid also provided me a space that allowed me to, like, be kind of kind, like, he was very kind with me through the whole coming out process, and he was very understanding. And so, that also like gave me the room to to kind of grow and be comfortable with myself and the fact that I was now out and there was kind of not that there was any going back but it felt like it was a bit more permanent now that my my parents and my grandparents knew right but I think um kind of on the topic of love when I think about you know love and coming out I think about the thing that um age sometimes does is like this idea of becoming kinder and being more accepting of like different things um, was that I remember when, when I came out to my grandmother, she was like, are you healthy? Are you happy? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, okay, that's all that matters. And like, for me, like that, that being her immediate reaction was just, it was a huge kind of reassurance that like, if she, she she's not going to let my parents like do any, even though they were acting crazy, like she's not going to let them be that crazy. So it, it really kind of gave me that that grounding but and and really that pure sense of like love like that's what when you think about what love means and I don't, and I don't know how you define love but like for me love is like I, I love you so that I and what that means is I want you to be happy and healthy and like you know living a full fulfilled life and sometimes that means that I love you and we don't talk that often right because you know and I think that a lot of people, um, I was reading in this book, I can't remember what book it was, but uh, that love means that like, you need to be with those people. Oh, it was from Tara Westover in the book Education. She was reflecting on the her, her relationship with her family. And she said something along the lines of like, you can love someone and still let them go. Like you can, that is actually a, an act of love, um, an act of love to yourself. And it doesn't disconnect that you still want the best for those people, but you recognize that the, having that person in your life is not healthy for you. Right. And so I thought that that was really powerful, but. No, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's nice that you read that, but it's nice that you read that. And I think you, so for me, I think like, like I knew I loved you from the, from when, once I finished up a building. And then there was this moment in my life where I was using crystal math 
and life was just crumbling around me. And all I wanted was love, but I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know what to say to people. Um, I had Rick, hit, hit rock bottom. Um, oh. And I remember you being like, just come over. And I came over and we just cuddled. And, and it was so, this awkward moment because I, like, I'm like, I just need this human connection. And you were like, okay, I'll be the small spoon. And we were just sitting there like really awkward on the couch, but I remember my heart being like. I remember that moment. And I would think it was like shortly after you had told me that you were struggling with um, addiction. And I, I, and I would, I'll say that, that it was the first time that I had like someone close to me that was struggling with an addiction like that. And so it was a bit scary for me just in terms of like my concern around your safety. Um, but I remember that moment and I remember being like, this is like, like you were, you were super vulnerable in that moment. And I like, I, I really appreciated and felt love because of your vulnerability. I think that like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask just anyone to do that. And that meant that you like, you trusted me that you really felt that like, I, you know, I loved you and that I had kind of, um, I wanted good things for you and I wanted this, like it, it It really was like a nice moment of feeling like, oh, you know, this is this is love too. Like this is, and, and that's the thing that I think, um, uh, like when you said that we're gonna talk about love, I was like, I love that in in my life, I've been able to discover that love can look and look and feel so different and it can it can it doesn't have to fit into any sort of binary or any sort of like way of loving right like i think everyone receives and, and gives love differently but like i was very grateful for that moment because it just i i really like it sticks out in my mind too and i was wondering whether you were going to bring it up but like i remember being like oh this is this is like really nice so yeah thank you for that no thank you for that i feel like you know in like I've seen you build brown community. I've seen you bring build brown boy, gay boy love and commit to that within yourself, within the people you hang out with. Um, and also like backstory of that also about having Raheem live with me. Raheem was like, yeah, Vijay called me and asked me, what do I need to do to create a safe space for Shafiq? And what do, like, how do I, like, I feel like your inner, your inner parent, like your inner mom and dad came out from your parents where they're like, yeah, a little bit. How do I how do I make sure he's happy? How do I make sure he's safe? How do I make sure this? And like for me to hear that after, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that he like it wasn't just like you put the work in when I didn't understand how to put the work in, but I know what I needed. And right. for that, like I think eternally grateful. And also it's modeled such a life, a way of life for me because I'm like, oh, sometimes somebody just wants you to come over and cuddle them. And yeah. You don't have to ask any questions. You don't have to like, you don't have to fix them. You don't have to do anything. Just come over and we'll hang out. Yeah. And also I think just hang out in silence is fine. Cause I don't remember if we were talked and I think like we just like sat there and I was like, like my body just needed rest and kindness. Yeah. And it was the first, it was such a good, great sense of love that I like, it still beams in my heart. It still makes me want to cry. So um, it's something I didn't get outside of my family, right? And in the moment I was like, oh my God, this is what chosen family looks like. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And like the importance of chosen family and like how building relationships outside of your kind of nucleus family or biological family or whatever is like so important. And like the, the idea of like loving your friends in like a very kind of more radical way or, or more than like, you're just like, you, you have permission. Like, I think sometimes we, we worry about like, because friends can kind of come and go, we, we worry about what if they go and I don't want to attach myself too much to one person, but like people are going to come and go regardless. It's better to kind of go into things with like a fuller, you know, effort than just like kind of like, uh, you know, whatever. So. Uh, no, I think, I know it's a hundred percent you, like you're and it was authentic. It was vulnerable. Like as much as I was being vulnerable, you were also being vulnerable because you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Here's what's here's what you know, a clinical psychologist has told me. But in the moment, like mm -hmm. you know, Raheem and I have this concept all the time where like, I don't know why I keep looking there, he's I can hear his voice. But we talk about this all the time where like he's got a clinical brain about things and then I've got this experiential. And we talk about it, and I'm like, yeah, your textbook says this, but here's what my life really looks like. Right. And they conflict, right? So like even in the moment, you can be like, it's like it's like also like it's like doing a theater play where you can read the script, you can memorize it, but the day of it's like you're live.
things can happen. You just have to go with the flow. And you, I feel like, I don't know what he told you, but I feel like you just went with the flow that time. You're like, I get the team in. I feel like I know, like, I understand heartbreak. This person's in a moment. Yeah. I'm just going to go with the flow. And it was magical for me. It was like exactly what I needed in that moment. So for uh-huh. the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so here we are, two gay brown boys who grew up in suburbs of Ontario, uh, speaking about being gay. What would you tell? I mean, it's a classic Oprah question. What would you tell your younger self? Mm. Um, I think that like, and and this is something I still kind of work on and, and struggle with, but like, it's about like, it is more about being present. It is more about being grateful, like just like, and being like confident in, in your abilities. Like, I think that oftentimes when you're different from everyone else, you feel like you're lacking or you feel like you don't have anything to offer because it doesn't fit into those boxes particularly the boxes that like suburban life can put you in sometimes right and so I think that growing up I always had that sense of like oh I need to do more I need to like work harder I need to prove myself but like that sometimes like just kind of showing up for people and being your authentic self is enough and like you don't need to do much more than that right like my 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 thing with you like that story that you just told in terms of your addiction and that kind of thing was like, I also was calling Raheem cause I was like, should I like give him advice? Like, what should I be doing? And he's like, no, just like, just be there. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Like I can, I can be there because I was, I wanted obviously to support you in, in the best way I could, but like, I also wanted to like, make sure that I was doing it in the right way. And right. once I let go of like what it needed to look like. So I think that would be my advice to my younger self is just to kind of like let things flow a bit and be okay with like ups and downs. So I love that to understand, right? Like I feel like even me growing up, like there's like I need to fit this mold, and this is the only mm-hmm. way I'll be accepted. But at the end of the day, even like my grandma to her dying bed was like, "Are you happy?" And I'm like, "What is simple? Like you what know, is like, simple? Yeah, yeah. There's books and things, and people like you have guides in the world that tell you live be happy, and it's really as simple as just go with the flow and make it short. Like people all the time is like, "Will this make me happy?" Yes or no, then he wouldn't do it. Empty the dishwasher, bitch. I don't care how unhappy it makes you. <laughs> but it's also allowed me to guide. I'm like, oh, yeah, like it's, it's really as simple as to be like, and it, it's just in the moment. Does it make me happy right now? No. I mean, I have to right. clearly empty the dishwasher at some point, but at this moment, it doesn't make me happy. I'm not going to do it. I'll do it when I'm feeling happy about it. Yeah. So simple. And, yeah, I think it is a simple, simple lesson, but one that I, I, I continue to try and remind myself of too is that like, because it's easy to slip back into, I think, patterns like that. Right. So, you know, um, oh my God, what's her name? Black music artist does a flute. Oh, Lizzo. Lizzo said this, right? She goes, you know, I've taken forty years to get here. Right. It's going to take me ex- the same amount of time to unlearn all these things. So, mm-hmm. to our younger selves, like, just go with the flow. The, the lessons will come and then at some point something like great like you have to unlearn these behaviors mm-hmm. or accept them as who you are and just move forward with them exactly um yeah so how do you choose love so on the days where you don't love yourself or you're having a bad moment what do you say to yourself to choose love or do you even maybe you don't choose love i i think that it's something that i have to like remind myself of but I think that I also when I'm feeling like bad I try and do something that I know is going to make me happy so it makes me feel like like I'll like give myself a face mask or like I like do something that's like kind of a bit more relaxing like I'll watch you know a funny episode of a show that I like Schitt's Creek or something like that just to like kind of get my mood up but like it's hard sometimes to be like yeah you're good like you know, when, especially when you've had kind of a bad day or whatever, but I think that it is something that I try and like remind myself of is that like to be kinder to myself, like it doesn't necessarily even mean like, I think that being kinder is an act of love, but like you can be, I can be really hard on myself sometimes. And so I think that sometimes just having the ability to be like, just like be kind to yourself right now can be that, that act of love. That's so like, it's so simple, again, so simple. And it's something that I think in addiction also, like, you know, when every time we see slips or have a bad day, we, like the first thing I'm always like, did you eat? Did you sleep? 
are you being just be kind to yourself today like it's done like eat sleep i think especially 2020 like i think a lot of people struggle with that right it's just like you know i didn't get anything done today and i've had so many of those days where i'm like completely unproductive at work because i'm just was like distracted by the news or whatever it may be and like i think in those moments i like would end the work day and be like i should have been more productive or i should have done this and it turns into a lot of that like should have or you know those messages and then i just have to remind myself like you know we're living through a pandemic not every day is going to be you know easy and like you have to kind of like go with that you know allow yourself to kind of also you know sit with that and and be okay with not being productive all the time which you know it's something that i struggle with but I think watching the news right now is being productive, like listening to the chaos and the insanity that's happening out of the States, which I I follow you on every social media platform, because I know you're engaged with this, but like being aware of the things is important because it also helps us guide what we want and don't want in our lives, right? So I think like, great, so I didn't get work done, but Mm -hmm. it's it's the balance factor, right? Like, (laughs) And speaking of um, the events that have ha- kind of happened i think yeah. you would really love the Brene brown podcast this week i don't know if the the not the dare to lead one the um becoming us um oh, okay. podcast she did a whole thing on like empathy and how we need to kind of approach this this kind of era and i i listened to it this morning um and it was it was a pretty powerful podcast so definitely yeah. recommend you to, to listen to that no, thank you. It's just on my like play- things to use now on my playlist, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just uh, I think I'm catching up on like post holiday stuff. Okay, like, yeah. I just kind nice. of get back into life again. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the funniest thing you've done today? The funniest thing I've done today. Oh, I don't know if I did anything really funny. I well, it was funny because I. I'm trying to like create new habits. I think we talked about this on the weekend. Is that right. like little habits are li- like small habits um, are is my resolution for 2021. And so one of my habits that I'm trying to form is doing exercise in the morning. And so I started using Apple Fitness Plus and they had this like really dancey, fun playlist that was, and so I was kind of like exercising, but kind of dancing in my living room. So I guess that was kind of funny. But. No, that sounds, that's actually sounds amazing. There's nothing funny about that. That sounds like a brilliant, uh, well, from this point of view, it sounds like yeah. a brilliant way to do it. Like you're, you love dancing and here's next as I teach to dance. Yeah. But yeah. It was fun. Uh, what's the meanest thing you've ever done? Oh. I never get to this question with most people. I feel like we get so caught up in the things, but this is one of my favorite questions to ask people. The meanest thing I've ever done? I don't. Come on. <laughs> I'm trying to think, I think that I probably been mean to, I don't know if, I don't know if the, I don't know how to quantify meanness. I've done some mean things, I guess, but like. You want me to share, you want me to share my mean story? Yeah, I want to hear what, an example, okay. when you were mean. So the meanest thing, all my meanest things are done to my youngest sister, Farah. <laughs> Okay. And Salima used to tag team and do it together. Where because she's so much younger than us, uh, we used to play games with her and then make like our goal was to make her cry. And the moment we broke her, we'd be like, you can't cry out here, you have to go cry in the bathroom. Like, what a bunch of assholes. <laughs> okay, so that reminds me of what like a, a a prank that we played on my sister for probably like three years, where we had this picture and it was it was my sister in a stroller and then my cousin and me on either side of the stroller. But we told my sister that that was actually my cousin's sister and that she wasn't part of the family yet because she was adopted. And we kept saying it to her and she just like used to get so mad and angry. And so that was kind of mean because it's probably like left some trauma on her, I'm sure at some point, but just like not feeling like she's part of the family. I don't know. But yeah, that was pretty mean of us. And it was like in, and I remember being at my grandmother's like kitchen table and she's just like, no, it is me. And I was like, no, no, actually you didn't come until later on. And she just, she was so upset. So yeah, that's probably pretty mean. But okay, so here's the thing. What was the lesson you think you, like, what were you trying to do? Like, what was, like now we can look back and be like, that's really mean. But in the moment, what were you, like as older siblings, we're just trying to teach our siblings something. What were you trying to teach her? Or what, were you, what was the point you were trying to make? 
or was it just being I don't, I don't know if it was a I think it was just like my my older cousin was also the ringleader and so she started it and I was like okay I'll I'm gonna follow along with this but yeah I, I do look back and be like that was kind of mean but we we laugh about it now so yeah. hopefully <laughs> Yeah, so mine is the same as I was like, we just want to make her tough. And we don't know why we want to make her tough. Like, there was no reason. But I, used to, like, I used to do that to my sister in, in high school. Like, I used to give her, like, kind of, like, lessons and be like, you need to learn this and, you know, right. be, like, better, blah, blah, blah. And she'd roll her eyes at me, but, it's, you know, it's fine. Yeah, I feel like there's a certain age where they're like, stop. I'm grown up enough to, like, be okay with this. And, yeah. Um, three people you secretly can't stand. Oh my God, these, are, I thought this was about love. This is like a very like, yeah. okay, so people I can't stand, uh, Donald Figu Trump. Okay. Obama. Like, I cannot stand that man. I think that he's scum. Um, who else can't I stand? I can't stand, so I have this like guilty pleasure of watching The View every day, which I don't know why, like I don't find that their political analysis is any good, but I do watch it every day. And Meghan McCain, I can't stand her. Like I just, okay. she grates me. Um, and who else can't I stand? I can't stand. Mm, trying to think of like a famous person or something that I can't stand, but. I don't really like Salman Khan. Okay. Yeah. It's not that I can't stand him, but I'm just like, uh, like, why are you famous? Yeah, true. And I think his dad is famous. Um, so the opposite of this question is, even though we've gone over time, is what would you do to find love for these people? Is there anything you can do to find love for these people? Trump, it's gonna be hard. Meghan McCain, I can understand, like I can find love for her because she grew up in a, like, I always have to kind of take into consideration someone's background and someone's like upbringing and how that shaped them and their kind of worldview. I think I just, I find her annoying. So that's why, you know, I can't stand her. Okay. And Salman Khan, I, I can, I'll find love for him because he's done a few of my favorite movies like um, Hamake Khan and, you know, um, Hamdil De Chukai Sanam. Like there's been a few movies that he's been in that I like really love and so, I find love for him because of that, but I do I do find him a little annoying. Right. It's so interesting. I feel like this question about loving Donald Trump or trying to think of like like if we're if we're in a goal to choose love, like how do you find the your biggest villain in life and choose love for them? I, I think that I can I can I can't empathize with him. I can maybe sympathize with the fact that he is clearly like a very broken person who's doing this out of like like you can just tell when someone hates themselves as much as he does, I think, and, and, and how troubled of a kind of, and how this greed and power has just like kind of turned him into this evil person. So I guess I can, I can feel love in that. <clears throat> I don't know why he is the way that he is because I didn't grow up in his, in his boots. I just, his current form, I can't really find love for. But you found, you found you, if you had a, if you, Get to a point where you need to choose a friend, you know a way you can do it, which is all I needed to hear. <laughs> okay. So for our last few seconds, I'm gonna throw, we're gonna wrap it up where I'm gonna throw one word at you and you throw <clears> one <throat> word back at me that relates to that word for you. Ready? Bollywood. Childhood. Love. Family. Dance. Fun. God. Question mark. Family. Love. Chosen family. Love. Jazz wedding. Excitement. Excitement. Yeah, Although I most like, people are saying it's my wedding, but it's, it's not, I promise. I mean, Selena had a wedding and it was her <laughs> wedding, but <laughs> I left with the Langa, so. I love it. Yes. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this. I love having to be able to share this with the world, to share you with the world, uh, um, and this side of you with the world. Uh, I want to thank all. I'm, I just want to say that, like, I'm really proud of all the things that you're doing um, in in your life and how you're really like. I can tell that you are in just a better place, and it makes me really happy to see that 
you like to see you grow like this and to have you a part of my life and to to share this moment was is really special so thank you for that no and thank you thank you for that moment of cuddle and for just being a sheer force of love like like i said like you're brown boy magic for me where oh. like you know you're like brown boy magic plus like jaya bachan from no i don't know one of the one of the movies that she was in yeah yeah hey triple three like that's can, can we do I'm another talking. podcast where you're malika though yeah i mean so since i had an eyebrow accident earlier right i'm gonna i think i'm just gonna shave them off and do more malika stuff right now because Love it. i mean if it's gonna grow back they might as well grow I'll back interview full. i'll interview her that would be great okay done let's do it i'm excited about that oh my god that would be so good <laughs> <laughs> on that note thank you for everybody for taking time out of your busy time just to share this moment with the vijay and i uh it was so great and i can't wait to do more of this lots of love bye bye, bye.